I could maybe have a volunteer from the audience, someone who might to take a picture of. <laughs> okay. Thanks all for coming, and thanks to Mysterious Bookshop for letting me be here. This is an incredible store, and I hope that you all come back here many, many times, because it's you know, the best store in New York City. And I'm going to uh, read to you a short section from this book. It's not going to be very long. Uh, I'm not going to start at the beginning of the book because that would make things too easy for all of us. Instead, what I'm going to do is pick it up on page 27. And I have to tell you a little bit about what happens leading up to this page. My private eye grew up without parents or a home in Washington. So when his best friend asked the private eye to help the best friend find his daughter, the private eye says yes. Because the idea of bringing a father and daughter together is very appealing to him, not having had any family himself growing up. So his investigation takes him early on to Capitol Hill. And this is the section I'm going to read to you. Inside the Rayburn House office building, I stepped through the metal detector, then watched my phone glide across the grainy black and white TV screen, a fuzzy shape on a fuzzy gray background. It reminded me of the first time I'd ever seen a security monitor. I was a kid inside a Metro Rail Guards kiosk. I don't have what you'd call a linear memory of childhood. Tiny pieces like flecks of light filtered through tree leaves, shifting, winking, on and off, so jumbled I couldn't tell you what was real and what I dreamed of. Fragments of images, ghost sensations. I see myself in a baby's crib under a porch light at night. A woman, my mother, walks past me into the house. Why am I outside? Why doesn't she pick me up, take me in with her? Did it really happen? I have sense memories of a woman holding me, a dog barking, the smell of sulfur, and snow falling. Another jump cut, and I'm older, on the streets of Washington, looking at the US Capitol simmer in the heat, thinking it was a merry-go-round. As a kid, each day I spent on the street, I figured I was stealing, getting away with something. I had no idea to see what I was losing. You live on the street, the first thing you lose is your identity. If you're young, this happens fast. There's lots of reasons why. Number one is the people around you. Men and women and boys and girls who've passed through society like phantoms through an alien dimension, existing only in a stranger's peripheral vision. Fill it for the paper's metro section. These folks are your peers, your friends, the village that's raising you, except it's not really a village. It's a pack. So you do what they do. This time I'm telling you about, when I got busted, wasn't the worst of it, not by a long shot. It's just the first time I got caught. And God is definitely part of my first true linear memory. He has some scam using a Xerox and a $5 bill, slipping the copies into the fare card machines of the Metro. He knew the bill readers in those machines couldn't tell a copy from the real thing. God, a 10-year-old black kid whose full name was Godfrey White, had been my mentor for a month. I would bumped with him beneath the Whitehurst Freeway in a cardboard box that had once held a GE refrigerator, two-door, self-defrosting, <coughs> ice maker included. With God's help, I knew I could stay out of Junior Village and Bachman's. I'd never been to either, but my mental image was if they caught me, I'd get chained to the wall and gnawed on by rats. Later, I found I wasn't far off the mark. Getting me into the Metro Guard's kiosk had been part of God's grand plan. I had paid attention when he explained how he would feed the Xerox copies of his $5 bill into the Metro fare card machines. The amount of $5 would light up. Then God would tab the minus button until the fare showed five cents. Jab another button, and down the chute would tumble four dollars and ninety-five cents and change. Not a bad return on a ten-cent Xerox. The only trouble with God's fare card scam was that the bottom of the coin return was metal. All that change tumbling down made a racket. The Metro guard, who sat in a nearby glassed-in booth, might begin to suspect something, particularly if you heard that same sound ten times in a row. God figured that 4950 was all the change he could carry away in his paper sack. My job? Distract the guard. How? I asked. Cry and tell him you're lost, God said. I was a despicable little brat, and I took to my role with gusto. I played the lost little boy with an intensity that would have expelled me from the most amateur play. I was too young to know better. I thought I was great. I cried, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, as I approached the Metro guard, and he recoiled exquisitely. I was incoherent with fear and pain in hopes he would open the door to the booth and I could get inside. He didn't want to leave his booth. 
He tried speaking to me through his little microphone. I wasn't having that. I cried harder. My pale little face beat red, the tears streaming down. Real tears. I was playing an abandoned kid, method acting. I beat my little fist against the window to block out the sound of the change gushing down the chute. God told me I get half the take, and that was all the motivation I needed. Finally, the guard, a kindly looking white guy with a salt and pepper goatee, opened the door. I practically fell inside. I hugged his knees and cried, my voice bouncing off the glass walls of the booth. So far, God had used four of his copies. What's the matter, boy? The guard asked. I wailed even louder, my ear-splitting voice reverberating off the glass walls. It was even giving me a headache. Did you lose your mommy and daddy? My mouth opened. I screamed and nodded. Outside, a steady stream of change clanged. Where'd you lose him? I heard another crash of coins. That would be eight, and took a breath. The guard thought he was calming me, but I was building towards my big finish. In heart-rending sobs, I said that the subway <coughs> doors had closed, and my parents in the train had pulled away without me. Which way was the train going? I'll call ahead, the guard said. Not here, I sobbed. D downtown. The stutter was a nice touch. Meanwhile, God had finished, and hefting his swag, staggered toward the exit. I held up my hands to the guard. I said, I was all right now. I find my folks. Don't worry. I figured he'd be glad to get rid of me. I was wrong. He started to come <clears> after me, his hand out, a solicitous, solicitous expression on his face. I backed away, realizing I may have overplayed my part just a tiny bit. I retreated into something and fell, and there was a crash, and God's bag of coins hit the tile floor, and coins were bouncing off the floor like water drops on a red-hot skillet. The last time I saw God, he was hot-footing it out of there as the Metro guard grabbed my arm, his fingers tight. I can still feel his fingers there. So that's, that's a little section from the book. <laughs> and all through the